Ernest Hemingway's 1940 novel For Whom the Bell Tolls takes its title from John Donne's 1624 work Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions, specifically Meditations 17 which reads, Never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. The passage, written during a period of convalescence, refers to the tolling of a funeral bell and invites us to consider how we are affected by a person's death. It can be read in many ways, either in the literal sense that a dying man may not know that the bell is tolling for him, or in the more metaphysical sense that we are, all of us, involved in mankind, and that the death of one means the death of us all, or at least some small part of us. It's this latter interpretation that Hemingway favours. For Whom the Bell Tolls was written following his experiences reporting on the Spanish Civil War, which ended in 1939 with the Second Spanish Republic overthrown by a nationalist uprising. The title For Whom the Bell Tolls urges America to join the Second World War, expressing that the fight against fascism was not just a European problem. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. America need not ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for them. Keru no Tami ni Kane Wanaru, or the frog for whom the bell tolls, uh, as it turns out, has absolutely nothing to do with any of that, and it's just about a frog that needs to ring a bell. In retrospect, I probably didn't actually need to read any of this. Complete waste of time, I am so sorry. So what's the script with this? Well, The Frog For Whom The Bell Tolls was released for the Game Boy in 1992. It stayed in Japan until 2011 when it was translated into English by dedicated fans, specifically these ones. The game is probably most well known as a footnote in the Zelda series, its engine was, supposedly, reworked for use in Link's Awakening. And I think that's unfair, partly because I think the game deserves to be discussed on its own merits, but mainly because I'm a wee bit suspicious. I, I just get the wee hint, like the, yeah just, yeah just a, a wee whiff, just, yeah, smells like pish. That was probably more provocative than it needed to be, but no, I do harbour doubts that there's a connection between the two games. While The Frog For Whom The Bell Tolls was a joint effort between Nintendo R&D 1 and Intelligent Systems, Link's Awakening was made by Nintendo EAD. While The Frog For Whom The Bell Tolls was released in September 1992, Link's Awakening was released the following June after a year and a half in development. In other words, the two games would have been in production around the same time, helmed by two competing divisions within Nintendo. Interviews also suggest that Zelda started as a side project for Kazuake Morita, who handled most of the programming himself. Indeed, the games only share two credits between them, those being composer Kazumi Tataka and Link's Awakening illustrator Yoichi Kotabe, who gets a special thanks in The Frog For Whom The Bell Tolls. I'm not ruling it out, I'm not saying that it's impossible. The two games are undeniably similar, Richard pops up in Link's Awakening, and I have it on good authority that there is a connection. But personally, I've not been able to find any trustworthy sources to back it up, which either means that I am a genius sceptic of unparalleled scrutiny, or it means that I'm an idiot that can't do basic research. Six and two threes at this point, but if anybody has a source, I'd be happy to eat the old proverbial hat. And before you say it, no, TV tropes does not count. Regardless, I wanted to distinguish this as an R&D 1 title because The Frog For Whom The Bell Tolls is very much a product of its developer. Nintendo EAD releases tended to be characterised by their polish and their earnest charm, while R&D 1's games had more of a chaotic energy. They tended to defy convention and while there were some rough edges, their games also featured interesting ideas and at times even a wry almost cynical sense of humour. This was, after all, the same dev team that got through two Mario titles before seemingly getting bored and replacing the company mascot with an avaricious spoof. Ooh, now this is all dead interesting, shame Apple. Give us a minute, because I'm going somewhere with this. 
The frog for whom the bell tolls elevates itself through these R&D1 hallmarks. The game uses a wry sense of humour to contextualise its structure and mechanics. It defies convention by limiting the player's control over the player character, thereby adopting a different storytelling structure to many of its contemporaries and creating a stronger character as a result. The Prince of Sable may be one of Nintendo's most well-defined protagonists. On a basic level, The Frog For Whom The Bell Tolls turns the premise of the Frog Prince on its head. The classic fairy tale about a princess who learns from a frog the value of those beneath her and is literally rewarded handsomely for it, instead becomes a story about a haughty prince who must forsake his nobility and become a frog to earn the love of a princess. The prince in question is the Prince of Sable, who, alongside his rival Prince Richard of the Custard Kingdom, sets off to the Meal Foy Kingdom to drive off the invading Crokeans and win the heart of the Princess Tiramisu. I assume that the planning meeting spilled over into lunchtime. Fairy tale parodies are well worn ground, but the frog for whom the bell tolls uses that familiar foundation to create and ultimately subvert expectations about its lead. There's a certain image associated with the fairy tale prince that goes on a journey to save a beautiful princess, just as there's a certain image associated with the Nintendo logo. But the prince isn't the happy-go-lucky hero or the brave but always helpful silent protagonist. He's volatile, he's selfish, he's arrogant, he's the comic relief. From the very beginning, the game is creating expectations that the prince is not intended to meet. The title sequence is a misdirect, giving Richard top billing, describing him as astute and brave before acquainting us with the noble but impetuous Prince of Sable. By introducing him before the Prince of Sable, the game gives the impression that Richard is the default prince, the control prince, if you will, that all other princes will be compared to. And that comparison is not in the Prince of Sable's favour. During the first area alone, he comes up short against Richard in combat, and then burns through 10 million in funds, much of that in exchange for a bottle of wine. The prince, worn down by the townspeople making jokes at his expense, is so overwhelmed by a stranger's kindness that he gifts her a million nuts, which is chump change in his eyes. The story of the kind-hearted peasant that goes from rags to riches after helping out a down-on-his-luck prince is another fairy tale staple, but the prince's selfishness is exposed when the woman spends that money on earthquake relief. His chump change was enough to pay for the repairs and the medical expenses of an entire town. Later on, the prince has to hire the services of a miner to dig up some gold. The Crokians have closed the mine and the newly unemployed Russell can be found at the bottom of a bottle in the local pub. Wait a minute. Closing the mines? Putting good men out of work? Being a giant snake? Who's the villain? Maggie Thatcher? To inspire Russell back into action, the prince, who may I remind you is a prince, beats up the out of work drunken destitute and then has the brass neck to boast to him about how, despite being fabulously wealthy, he's never allowed himself to be a slave to money. And yes, that is a joke. The game makes it very clear what it thinks of the prince's hypocrisy. Royalty, particularly in fairy tales, is often presented as being worthy of their status by some inherent quality whether that be wisdom, strength, or just plain providence. But being born into status hasn't left the prince wise and even-handed. He's ignorant and he's poorly adjusted to the wider world that he's entered. If anything, he's only able to wreak as much havoc as he does because of the catastrophic pairing of power and irresponsibility. The fairy tale world that assumes everything will go right for him exists only in his own head, and the game clocks a lot of comedy miles just by having him face consequences for his actions. After the first couple of times, the player should catch on, but it takes the prince a lot longer to figure out that he isn't the centre of the universe. I suppose it's easier to see somebody's flaws from a top-down view. What makes the prince's flaws appealing is the way that the world and the characters are in on the joke. 
The characters do everything that they can to undermine his authority. Even Wasabi has more influence than the prince. The story's farcical structure is pushed forward by the prince's characterization as a short-sighted narcissist. His solutions often create new, increasingly more unlikely problems that he then needs to sort out. Because he spends his money so frivolously at the beginning of the game, the prince finds himself unable to repair the spring bell that could break the frog curse, so he hires some workers to excavate some gold, whereupon their digging causes a volcano to erupt, and you get the idea. Each one of these points is its own area to explore and puzzle to solve. The game calls upon the player to enact each of the character's stupid mistakes. In fact, the only way to stop the prince from making these stupid mistakes is to simply not play. But in the heat of the moment, a lot of his decisions actually make sense. It doesn't feel like the game is cheating you by forcing you to make what is clearly a bad choice. Each situation organically calls for a new mistake to be made as part of its resolution. And the player is never blamed for these mistakes either. There is a clear delineation between the player and the prince. It's clear that the character is stupid due to the game's script and structure, rather than the player's decisions. It's impossible to refuse the Witch Mandola's potion, for example. Refusing will only open more dialogue, drawing the prince towards the two inevitable options. Drink or drink. The game's very linear as a result, and I find that interesting because it requires a different kind of investment from the player than many of Nintendo's titles even today. Nintendo traditionally tend towards static goals. There's usually a major villain whose defeat, sometimes immediately following their first appearance, marks the end of the game. But the frog for whom the bell tolls requires a lot of good faith from the player as they're forced to play with a character that has a mind of his own. They have to be willing to relinquish control and laugh along when the game needs the prince to do something reckless. The farcical structure means that the game heavily favours its own story over interactivity. The player is essentially just solving puzzles to get to the next story beat. That might sound like a damning criticism, but the context motivates its audience to go along with the stupidity. I mentioned earlier that in the heat of the moment, a lot of the prince's choices make sense, and the game accomplishes that so well by appealing to emotion rather than reason. Richard's rivalry with the prince, perhaps because of its pettiness, has an emotional friction that inspires rash action. Richard spends the beginning of the game knocking the wind out of the prince's sails, or rather just stealing the boat out from under his feet. So when the opportunity presents itself for the prince to get a leg up over his rival, the player has been goaded into striking a hasty bargain right alongside the character. Just as the story parodies a traditional fairy tale, the mechanics parody traditional RPGs, featuring turn-based battles and a rudimentary levelling up system. Both are paired back to the point of being reductive. The player has little control over what happens during a battle, but through this reductive parody, the game is able to express the prince's personality. Entering combat sees the prince and his opponent disappear into a ball of dust. From there, the fight happens without the player's input, whether they want it to or not. The prince and his opponent take turns trading damage based on their respective stats. While the game adopts the levelling up mechanics traditionally associated with RPGs, the prince increases his stats not by battling and grinding, but by collecting saint stones hidden around the map. So his power is dictated by the level designers rather than the player. He physically cannot become more powerful than an area allows. Along with the automated combat, battles are decided before they are even entered. If the prince isn't strong enough to win a battle, then the player needs to find some stones or solve the area's puzzle. So the prince, both as a playable character and otherwise, doesn't have much range. There's no way to cast him in a different role by tinkering with his stats or using different strategies. There's no way for an underleveled prince to overcome a tough opponent that could empower the player to live out the fantasy of being a cunning strategist. There's no way to look or feel cool during these fights. The cartoon ball of dust drives this point home. This isn't a battle of skill and wit, but a desperate, clumsy scrap. For many players, this will, understandably, be an enormous turn-off. But The Frog For Whom The Bell Tolls is a game with a lot of focus on characterising its protagonist for laughs. 
He wouldn't be so strong a character if the player could just choose not to be incompetent. While the game mainly spoofs western fairy tales, it has a strong influence from Chinese and Japanese stories as well. The prince's two transformations into a frog and a snake seem to be taking their cues from Mushi Ken, an early Chinese version of rock paper scissors that used a frog, a snake and a slug. These transformations are triggered in a manner not dissimilar to Ranma 1 half, or in other words, similar to Ranma 1 half. I have no idea why I write things like that. Falling in water transforms the prince into a frog. The juxtaposition between the grandeur of a prince and the lowliness of a frog is just as effective here as it was in the original fairy tale, and while he gains some new powers as a frog, the prince is unable to fight at all. Eat an egg and the prince transforms into a snake, which can sneak through narrow passageways and talk with other snakes. There's a certain connotation to snakes that they've been unable to shed, and this is reflected in the mechanics. When transformed, the prince isn't courageously meeting his foes head on, but disguising himself as the enemy and sneaking around. Neither transformation is very heroic. References to other series also cast the prince in an unflattering light. The game tips its hat to The Legend of Zelda a few times throughout, and each time the prince fails to live up to Link's example. Completing the forest maze leads the prince to muse that he had seen that trick before, referencing a nearly identical puzzle in the first Legend of Zelda. While the puzzle may have been mysterious and interesting there, the frog for whom the bell tolls trivialises it by acknowledging that the player is likely to have seen it already. Later, the prince has to fetch the mirror shield, which is borrowed from A Link to the Past, in order to fight a mammoth. But after a lengthy side quest, the prince returns, shield on arm, and finds that he still doesn't measure up. He has to go on yet another quest to collect a device that lets him control animals. It may be a bit of a slog, yet another breadcrumb in the game long trail, but it characterises the prince very differently to his predecessors. His skills come up short in comparison to the Elder, and metatextually, he also comes up short in comparison to Link, who uses the Mirror Shield to vanquish much greater foes. The Prince is so pathetic that it's no wonder he turns to the drink. The health restoration item is a bottle of wine, and that decision is, in and of itself, characterising. Wine isn't known for its rejuvenating qualities, but alcohol is known to make people overestimate themselves. They feel stronger and more confident. It's liquid courage. The prince isn't restoring his health by mending his wounds, but by patching over his fortitude. It's not an airtight reading, as the prince is still clearly getting hurt and he needs to be treated at hospitals, so whether or not you think that's an incomplete idea or just me talking pish is up to you but I think, at the very least, it adds a little flavour to the prince's character. It's perhaps a blessing that the game was never officially translated, wine is a lot more characterful than the inevitably censored potion we'd end up with. Something that I think is perhaps underappreciated in games is their ability to make you feel empathy for a well-defined character. The discourse often prizes player freedom and expression, and I understand why, but while that's the textbook strength of an interactive medium, I don't think that's the only strength it has. I think there's something to be said for linear games with bespoke experiences that complement the themes in the character arcs. This may seem like a lot of words to waste on what is a short, and if we're being entirely honest, overall inconsequential Game Boy game, but I think at the very least there's some useful stuff to take from it. While it is a fairly basic parody, a lot of its effectiveness is in its strong spine, a focus beyond just spoofing tropes. While it is satirical from time to time, its effectiveness isn't in its broad cultural significance, but rather in how that satire is employed to the same end as the rest of the game, mocking the prince. The story, the structure and the mechanics are all devoted to that same cause, and while I don't think it has any deep meaning, the results of that focus speak for themselves. The Prince leaves an impression, and honestly, that was more than I expected going in. The only part that I found a wee bit weak was the ending. I don't think I'm going to spoil too much by revealing that everyone lives happily ever after, but to accomplish that, the game shifts to frame the Prince as a bit of a sweetheart. Tiramisu, who seems like a willful character based on her actions, just meekly goes along with the decision to marry him, 
she doesn't even get a line telling him that she accepts his proposal. A willful woman who's cowed when a man tells her what to do in a Nintendo game? Who wrote this, Yoshio Sakamoto? Och, I'm only kidding. A massive thank you to all of my patrons for all of their support, particularly those names on screen just now. Although I have to stress, I'm grateful to all of you, thank you. More patrons means that I can justify spending more time and energy on these videos, so if you would like to help support the channel, consider pledging or even just sharing a video that you enjoy. Special thanks to Stuart Jip for loaning me that history of frogs in video games gag. He managed to make that funny around seven or eight times in a row, and I barely managed it once. I also want to say thank you for all your patience. It has been a hellish year, although I don't think that I'm alone in that. I hope you're all staying safe, and thank you for watching. I'll be back next time with a game that you've actually bloody heard of.